Hello, everyone. Bonjour tout le monde. Welcome to the community, pardon me, welcome to the Communities for Climate Resilience, Climate Resilient Foundations webinar. My name is Tracy Babrick, and I'm the Director of Learning and Network Engagement with Community Foundations of Canada. And it's so lovely to see each of you with us today. I'm coming to you from my home in Calgary, Alberta, Treaty 7 territory on the traditional lands of the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Sutina, the Stony Nakoda Nation, and Métis Nation. I am grateful to work, live, and learn on the traditional territory of Treaty 7, and I'm continuing to learn more about how I can be a better friend to the Indigenous communities, and I am committed to the hard work and my part in reconciliation. Before we dive into today's session, I would like to go through some housekeeping details with you. So just a friendly Zoom reminder, we are in meeting mode and you can see and hear us and we can see and hear you. Please use the mute, but the mute button during our presentation today. If you have questions throughout the session, please pop them into the chat box and we'll be incorporating and collecting your questions for a short Q&A at the end of, of today's presentation. And for the best experience, please close all other applications and use the speaker view on Zoom and turn up your computer's volume. Today's session is scheduled to run from 1 to 2.20 p.m. Eastern time and is available in both French and English. To access the French and English interpretation, you'll see the globe at the bottom of your screen. And if you click on that globe, we can switch between the, the different languages of French and English. And the recording of this webinar and this, this gathering today will be sent to you in a follow-up email, and it will be available as well online in the Community Foundations of Canada resource library. Now, I am extremely excited to introduce our speaker for today, Katie Harper. Katie is the Senior Advisor at Project Neutral. Project Neutral is an organization that seek to educate individuals and organizations about their climate impact and the importance of taking climate action. Katie designs and delivers climate education and activation programs, including Talk Climate to Me, which is a fun, free, unscary online climate education experience for women, as well as Green from Home, which is a climate education and action program for workplaces. Casey, Katie, pardon me, works on climate engagement in the nonprofit sector and corporate sector and has been doing so since 2008. She loves helping people see what they can do to be part of creating a climate safe future. Katie, I wanna thank you for taking the time today to teach each of us and to help us further our shared goals of sustainability. I am absolutely honored to hand the screen over to you, Katie. Oh, thank you so much. Um, I am delighted to be here myself. Thank you very much. Um, yes, uh, it is really fun to be part of this program and uh, the work that the Community Foundations of Canada is doing and all of the actual community foundations, uh, the members who are out there. Um, it's really cool to have gotten a little bit of a taste over the last uh, few months about the things that you're doing. So I'm excited for this today. Um, I want to start acknowledging that I'm a settler currently living in Toronto, which is the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat, the Chippewa, and Anishinaabeg peoples, um, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, who are the current uh, treaty holders uh, with Treaty 13. And I want to pay my respects to them um, and to the wisdom of their elders and their cultures. And really to say that we can't solve the climate crisis without addressing the underlying systems that created it. Colonialism, extractive capitalism, patriarchy, white supremacy, these forces are the common root to the climate crisis and many of the world's other challenges. So we can't talk about climate solutions without indigenous rights. And I hope that you'll see that thread woven through uh, through our talk today. Okay, so what are we gonna actually do today? 
um, well, I imagine that most of you uh, got into this work, oh, uh, Madeline is asking me to slow down. Oh, I'll do my best. Uh, we have a lot to go through, Madeline. So let me know uh, if there's places that uh, that uh, where where I'm 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 getting a little bit too fast. Please uh, please give me a little uh, nudge, but I'll do my best to slow down. Um, most of you got into this work because you want to make the world better. So we're going to talk today about how climate change threatens your goals of nurturing healthy, equitable, and vibrant communities. We're gonna start by covering the climate facts that you need to know. And of course, leave a little space to acknowledge that the road ahead is not gonna be easy. In other words, we're going to face the polar bear in the room, but we're also gonna talk about what we can do. Climate scientist, Kim Nicholas, sums up the climate crisis like this. It's warming, it's us, we're sure it's bad, but we can fix it. So we're gonna talk about solutions. And we wanna show you that taking climate action can support better health and prosperity and quality of life for us all. Now, the issue of climate change can be kind of overwhelming. Like where does one even start? Well, this is where Project Neutral comes in. For more than a decade, we've been helping people understand their climate impacts and start taking action. We run a number of programs, and a lot of the videos that you'll see in today's session come from Talk Climate to Me, which is our climate course for women. women. So you may see that logo pop up throughout the session. Okay, with that background, uh, let's jump in. A lot of us weren't taught about climate change in school, so just in case, we want to get everyone on the same page uh, by starting with the basics. Really, the basics. What is climate change anyway? All you really need to know is that pollution is causing the planet to warm. This pollution is mainly caused by burning fossil fuels, things like coal, oil, and natural gas. This releases carbon dioxide, or CO2, though there are a few other gases as well that don't get quite as much attention, like methane. These gases act like a heat-trapping blanket around the planet. That's where the term greenhouse gas, or GHG, comes from. When carbon dioxide and these other gases are emitted, they trap heat, just like in a greenhouse. Now, GHGs are essential to life on Earth. This is what keeps the Earth at a livable temperature. Without them, it would be too cold for plants and animals to survive. But the problem is that humans have dramatically increased the concentration of greenhouse gases. This graph shows the rise in CO2 emissions. And notice how the curve, uh, the gray curve starts ramping up really dr drastically in the 1950s. The more greenhouse gases, the thicker the blanket and the more the planet heats up. The planet has already heated by one degree. Well, that doesn't sound like a lot, but in the history of the earth, temperatures have never increased by one degree in the span of 100 years. Thanks. Here's another way to think about it. Imagine the planet has a fever. When we get a fever, one degree warmer and you're sick, a two degree fever and you might be in the hospital. And if you have a three or four degree fever, that's pretty bad. It's the same for the planet. The planet has a fever because we're burning too many fossil fuels. Okay, but like, so what? It's cold in Canada, right? Won't heating up actually be kind of nice? Well, we asked some folks who are very invested in the future to explain why overheating, even by a couple of degrees, is a huge problem. Why does warming matter? Warming might sound good when you live in Canada, but it's really not. A few degrees warmer might not sound like much, but it really is. Our goal is to keep warming to 1.5 degrees because anything beyond that makes life really, really hard. Under 1.5 degrees is what we want to keep life safe. But the warming has already happened. Everything. Predictable weather patterns we've been used to for centuries are being disrupted, which means more extreme weather. Tornadoes and berry, flooding, my soccer games keep getting flooded out, droughts, and forest fires, making it hard to breathe. In some places, it's getting so hot, the world turns out. Pretty much everything we've thought of as normal has been disrupted by climate change. This isn't the hottest year. It's the coldest year of the rest of your life. At a certain point, we can't stop the warming because of feedback loops. This is when the warming causes more warming, and it just keeps looping and looping and looping. 
This is called runaway climate change. And you know it's bad, because if your dog ran away, that would not be good. That would be very bad. That's why it's really important that we bring emissions down now. Things are pretty serious, because we've already lost a lot of money, and there's not a lot of time to fix it. But there's enough time to create a better future if we get rid of right now. So, let's do it. What do you think? Are you up for it? <laughs> Okay, so climate change is already happening and we're already experiencing hardships from it. And this weird weather threatens what we love. Everything from soccer games getting flooded out to homes being destroyed by wildfires. Canada is warming at twice the global average and in the far north, it's even faster. The result, this weirder and wilder weather. That means more frequent and extreme floods, droughts, fires, storms. And these bring knock-on effects, disrupting our economy by damaging infrastructure, making food more expensive. This is a farm that was burned by wildfire and disrupting supply chains. In Germany, 80% of water freight travels the Rhine River, but record water lows, levels, record low water levels this summer caused major disruptions. But it's not just the economy. The World Health Organization calls climate change the single biggest health threat facing humanity. Here in Canada, this looks like wildfire-related asthma and deaths from heat waves, especially among seniors and vulnerable community members. And there's growing awareness that the toll that climate chaos is taking on our mental health is actually really quite significant. People are struggling with impacts like damage to their homes, evacuations, economic uncertainty, and losing traditional ways of life. I'd like to give you a moment to think about how this connects to you personally. So have you noticed any changes in your community? Maybe there are things that you used to be able to do as a kid that have changed. I'm gonna put on some music and stay quiet for a moment so you can reflect. Um, and I'd love it if you would share some answers in the chat. We'll take about 30 seconds here. Yes. Hello. Okay. I'm seeing some, uh, some, uh, Lynn is saying we used to jump off the roof on our house into huge fun snowbanks. They don't exist anymore. Um, oh man, I have memories of that, uh, that too. Um, and Penny was saying, uh, not much snow in the past few winters, but lots of ice. Um, and Abby's saying the wildfire smoke was so thick, we hardly spelt, spelt, spent any time outside. My two-year-old would come downstairs, look out the window and say, too smoky to play outside. Yeah, I mean, and, and you can just feel, Abby, I can feel the, the, no one wants to raise their kids, no one wants to put their kids uh, through that. And, and I'm seeing trends of things that, that the joys of our own childhood, we might not be able to pass on to our kids. And then on top of it, things like, um, hotter summers and less shade because the urban canopy is dying. This 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 cyclical effect of the urban canopy then not being able to protect us from the heat and so on. Um, there's a lot. Whatever you love, chances are it's being affected by climate change. Um, for people who love fishing, warmer waters and low water levels affect fish communities. Um, people who love wine, um, the changes in the growing seasons are threatening like varietals that have been around for centuries. For me, uh, I love cross country skiing, and I'm worried I won't be able to pass that on to my uh, to my kid, uh, to my kids. But yeah, it's everything is of being affected by climate change, the small things, the intimate things, and of course, the bigger the bigger pictures. Um, there's some neat other ones coming in too. I'll, I'll, I'll catch up with those in a second. Um, we wanna think about, that's some of the ways that climate change impacts us here in Canada, but how about taking action? You're gonna see a poll pop up. And the question is, how do you think that Canada is doing on climate compared to the rest of the world? Um, five is that we're doing awesome, one, not so much. So when uh, Kaltoon can pop the, the poll up there, you'll see it there. How do you think that Canada is doing on climate compared to the rest of the world? <laughs> how, how many, Kaltoon, how many um, people have, uh, have answered so far? 
So far, we have 32 responses, uh, what, 13% at horrible, 62% at poor, 26% at okay. So the majority of responses are at poor, number two. Okay, interesting. Can you, do you want, can you share the results? That sounds like we've got almost everyone uh, yes. um, answering. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, as we're uh, waiting for those those results to pop up, the um, lots of people sounded it sounds like lots of people thought that Canada wasn't doing great, um, and you may be more climate aware than the typical Canadian because eighty nine percent of Canadians think Canada is doing great on climate change, which is kind of natural, right? Canadian identity is all about endless forest, sea to shining sea. It feels like we should be climate leaders, right? Well, how is Canada doing? Yeah, then you're seeing this, uh, I'm, I'm just seeing the results pop up. Um, and most of you are thinking that we're either poor or horrible. So <laughs> let's find out. The embarrassing truth is that Canada is actually falling behind. Um, in fact, we're the third worst in terms of emissions per capita, meaning climate pollution produced per person. We like this chart because it breaks down emissions, like where they come from, but it doesn't include the, the US or us and Australia and their per capita emissions are similar to Canada's. Okay, that's per person, right? right? Um, what if you look at the total amount of carbon pollution overall? We're a small country, so that must be low, right? No, Canada is still in the top 10. That is not a top 10 list that I want to be part of. And as Canadians, we often lean on, well, at least we're doing better than the US. But the United States is lapping us on climate action. Their emissions have decreased by 10% since 2000. And with the recently passed Inflation Reduction Act, they're set to decrease by 40% by 2030 in Canada. Our emissions have actually increased. Now, we hear lots of excuses like it's cold up here, and that's true, but look at how these countries are doing. Not, we're not doing so great after all. Canada is the one in orange in the middle. There's Norway with a, on a downward uh, trend in purple. And yes, Norway has lots to do, uh, especially on reducing fossil fuel experts. But then there's Sweden, who's dropped 20% since 2000. Everyone needs to act on climate, and that is particularly the case for wealthy countries like Canada. We're polluting way more than our fair share. We create about one and a half percent of total climate pollution, but we're only half a percent of the world's population. So we're punching way above our weight in a very bad way. In fact, Canada is the only G7 nation where emissions are actually increasing. Okay, so where are these coming from? Time for another poll. Question here is, and Kaltoon, you can launch this poll, which uh, three sectors in Canada create the most GHG emissions? Uh, you'll get a chance to answer, to choose three from there. Um, it looks like we need to bump to the next poll. Yeah, there we go, should be coming up soon. Um, so think about it, Who, where do you think most of the emissions are coming from? Agriculture here? Yeah, awesome, thank you. Thank you, Kaltoon. Um, agriculture, oil and gas, Waste and others. See where your uh, see where your, your uh, results. Um, and Kaltoon, how many? Uh, what percentage are we at in terms of uh, responses? Should we close the poll? Not yet. We're just at okay. sixty-five, so we can wait a few minutes. So okay. Awesome. Oh, I'm interested to see what uh, what people come up with. All right. Let's close the poll in three. Last chance to get your final answers in three, two, one, and. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah. Share the oh, results. interesting. Okay, we're seeing the results now. Um, it looks like there's a pretty even spread, but transportation, oil and gas, and agriculture are coming across um, uh, as the as the leaders. Let's see how it actually breaks down. You guys are good. Um, this is the total greenhouse gas emissions or climate pollution for each sector for the country as a whole. So oil and gas is about 26% percent, but transportation is almost as high. Um, and it's not just big trucks or hauling our stuff. Personal vehicles are a big part of that. Um, then we've got heavy industry buildings, agriculture, uh, waste and creating electricity coming, uh, rounding out um, that 200. But what's not so great is that our emissions, particularly in oil and gas and transportation, continue to increase. So remember how Canada's overall emissions are increasing? It's really these two sectors that are driving, no pun intended, much of the increase. And speaking of which, did you know that Canadians buy the most gas-guzzling, climate-polluting cars on the planet? That is wild. 
Um, fortunately, there is a good news story here. Do you see that yellow graph, uh, the line, the yellow line that's going down? That's the pollution from creating electricity. And it has dropped mainly because of closing down coal-fired electricity plants. In Ontario, we used to have five coal-fired plant, coal plants, uh, and now we have none. That not only creates better uh, air quality, but also that's super important because as we move, uh, as we do this transition, we're going to rely on electricity more. So having clean electricity is really critical. We've made big environmental changes before, and it has made a difference. Now we need to do more and faster and do it in a way that is equitable for all people. And this is especially important because climate change doesn't affect all people equally. We live in a world of overlapping emergencies and the climate crisis is a threat multiplier. Um, that means that it makes existing problems worse. So we see this at the scale of countries. Um, in the global south, we're seeing terrible, uh, terrible things happening in Pakistan, for example, um, or we're seeing droughts that are decimating crops and what follows is famine, migration, conflict. These are all cascading impacts of climate disruption. But within Canada, climate change is also having an outsized effect on our most vulnerable communities. It disproportionately affects low income and racialized communities. For example, 25% of the poorest neighborhoods in Canada's urban areas are within one kilometer of a polluting facility. In some cases, like in Omjanong First Nation and Sarnia, residents are exposed to toxins that can be hundreds of times higher than Health Canada's limits, resulting in high rates of respiratory illnesses and rare cancers. Or think about this, low-income communities are more vulnerable in heat waves. Why? Trees. There are fewer parks and trees than in wealthier communities. Uh, I like this quote, if you show me a map of tree cover in any city, you're showing me a map of race and income levels. Now that was from American Forests, but it applies in Canada too. Without the cooling benefits of trees, lower income neighborhoods can be several degrees hotter in the summer. And in a heat wave, this can have sometimes fatal health impacts as people have suffer from heat strokes and heat related illnesses. Or what about this? Climate change impacts are not gender neutral. Already 80% of those displaced by climate change around the world are women. And there's a strong link between gender-based violence and extreme weather events. So these are just a few examples of how race, poverty, and gender intersect to increase one's vulner vulner vulnerability to climate impacts. Climate change threatens your ability to achieve your missions of healthy, equitable, and just communities. Okay, so it's happening. We're already feeling its effects. It's deeply unfair and it's gonna get worse, especially for communities that are already vulnerable. So it's still though hard to imagine what is going, what it's gonna be like. Recent extreme weather will give us a taste of what's to come, but like, what is it gonna be like a few years down the road? Will it be a literal dumpster fire? To understand what it will look like um, in our own communities, we asked one of our favorite climate experts, Dr. Laura Tozer, to give us a lowdown. Uh, Laura is an assistant professor at the University of Toronto, and she's also a member of Project Angel Steering Committee. So I want to preface this by saying that, yes, it's bad. Dr. Tozer tells it like it is, and it hurts. We have an obligation to tell you the truth, but it's not the end of the story. This is what happens if we don't take action. There's this whole climate doomer narrative out there that kind of justifies doing nothing because what's the point anyway? But we do have the solutions and we can fix this. So just keep that in mind as Laura walks us through this. Climate change means literally everything will change. Recently, we've seen unprecedented fires in North America. We've seen hurricanes that are stronger and more frequent. This is climate change happening in real time because we've already warmed the planet by one degree. As we continue to warm the world by burning fossil fuels, we know that our weather will continue to get weirder, whether that's more intense heat waves or more extreme flooding or more severe storms. At the rate we're going, in 30 or 40 years, Toronto could have 55 days a year above 30 degrees Celsius. When I was growing up here, there were an average of 12 days a year that high. These changes are so intense, we're breaking our cities. All of our infrastructure was built for the wrong climate now. When it's really hot, asphalt melts and train tracks expand. Already we've seen places where car tires have melted into the roads 
And when it was 46 degrees Celsius in parts of the US in 2021, doctors in the burn units had to issue a public warning because people were coming into the hospital with burns after they had touched hot asphalt. And flooding too. When 500 year flood events start happening every few years, it blows out bridges and swamps roads. I honestly don't know how to describe the danger we're in without warning you that our future climate could really become some kind of hell on earth. What is hot today becomes hotter tomorrow. Wildfires become more dangerous. Deadly droughts become more widespread. And there's a real danger of a horrible domino effect where something like a drought kills crops in the prairies and then higher food prices hurt people, especially the most vulnerable in our society. If we keep emitting carbon pollution, by the end of the century, civilization itself could be at risk. That might seem a long time off, but children who are already born will be there. What experts are really worried about are catastrophic, world-changing events, like forest diebacks across entire continents and collapsing ice sheets that raise the sea level by meters. We have to do everything we can to avoid runaway climate change that spirals out of control. Now, I know this feels overwhelming, but stay with me here. We can avoid these impacts. Our future is not set in stone. Every single action we take now to prevent warming matters. We can change things as long as we treat climate change like the crisis that it is. If this hasn't become clear, this isn't about saving the planet. It's about saving us. When I think about what's at stake, it can feel really overwhelming, especially on days when I feel like I'm the only one that's worried about this. But as Laura said, and what we want you to remember is that we still have a window to act. Every fraction of a degree matters. It's the difference between sea level rising in feet or meters and the millions of people who will be impacted. We need to act to protect what we love. And there is still so much that we can save. I wanna take a moment to acknowledge that for some of us, this might feel it's a lot. The climate crisis is overwhelming. For some folks, it might be shaking our sense of security for the first time and leaving us feeling disoriented and afraid. For other folks, it might be deepening a long-standing sense of insecurity and injustice. Whatever you're feeling, know that these are normal responses. And I actually want to pause here with these feelings because it's important to understand that people in your community, wherever you live, they're grappling with worry for, about the future. We need to actively engage with these emotions in ourselves, our colleagues, our board members, and in our neighbors. Rather than pushing the hard feelings away, notice instead what they can teach us. The grief, the rage, they're reminding us that things are off kilter and we need to heed their warnings. I want to take a moment here to give you a chance to notice how you're feeling. Uh, I'm going to stay quiet again for a moment and maybe take a breath, close your eyes if you like, check in with yourself. You can share uh, what you're feeling in the chat. Um, that's always very generous, but you also don't have to. You can just uh, keep it to yourself. We'll do about 30 seconds. One, two, three, four, Here is the thing about climate. Um, you can be in love with the creativity of the solutions, and we'll talk about some of those in a moment. But on the other side, feeling overwhelmed and sitting with grief, these are reasonable responses too. I recently heard Adrian Marie Brown ask, how do we be with the suffering that is actually happening right now and with all the possibility that is opening and unfolding? This is a time for courage and action but we need to tend to our feelings to build up our capacity to sit with both the brokenness and the possibility. Penny's saying, I was listening to a CBC interview um, uh, with a climate depression specialist psychologist. We can do the little things to help. That's right. And people in your communities will need um, 
need as leaders in these your communities you have a unique opportunity to support your neighbors in developing their own resilience because <laughs> this is the work of our lifetimes we're not going to solve climate change tomorrow and we need to be able to carry on in the face of these challenges okay so we're going to switch gears the climate crisis is creating so much suffering and it's going to get worse. And that is usually where the story ends. But it doesn't have to be this way. There are actually reasons to hope if we kick into action. So let's talk about what happens if we succeed. We cut emissions in half every year until they're zero. And we keep warming within 1.5 degrees, what climate scientists say we need to avoid the worst of climate impacts. Frankly, most of us don't have a lot of practice imagining a world where we actually get it right. So we wanted to help you out. We're going to go on a little journey together. OK, are you ready? Here we go. We've magically transported ourselves 28 years into the future. It's the year 2050. We meet Jamie. She joined the climate movement in her 40s to demand a better future. And she tells us how the world has changed. What do I remember from 2022? <clears throat> Fear, fear of COVID, fear of each other, fear of the future, virus. Oops, oh, I'm so sorry. That was a slip of my cursor. Let me do that again. I'll move it forward a little bit. I met the COVID climate before. Things have gotten so bad, so fast. Floods, fires, droughts, hurricanes happening all across the globe, all at the same time. But it, it finally sank in, it finally meant things had to change. And the world leaders, they were still not acting fast enough. They were still drops of profit out of the ground. So we took to the streets. And when I say we, I mean all of us, not just the quote-unquote radicals. I went to the first rally of my life in 2022. It was not the last. The challenges seemed insurmountable. But you know what? stayed in the streets until things changed and then boy did things change a rapid accelerating almost unbelievable change it was incredible to be part of it we felt like we were living through the most exciting time in human history and it it took me a while to get over my fear my fear of change but fear wasn't necessary. What was necessary was openness and hard work. I mean, oil sands were over, but there were plenty of new jobs. Because there was so much to do. And there were so many, so many jobs in the infrastructure that they were hard to fill. Houses had to be retrofitted with heat pumps and insulation. Public transit was scaled up. With people no longer thinking train was a dirty word, and cities added bicycle lanes for all the new cyclists, and, and the parking lots were turned into gardens for local communities to grow food and enjoy life. There was a time when I didn't know my neighbors very well, but after the flood of 2023, we became very close. I mean, we'd all pitched in to help one another when we were without power for weeks. And after that, we worked together to create this, this beautiful, friendly street with lots of outdoor seating and greenery. I even make things when you do. And they help me when I am. Sometimes we jam. I'm learning to play the electric bass. <laughs> the future. 
future isn't what we expected. It isn't a world of flying cars and metallic miniskirts. It's more like we got rid of the bad, unhealthy things that had created the crisis. And we kept the best parts of the world that we know and love. Getting rid of the bad and keeping the good, that sounds pretty sweet to me. Um, I'm curious, what stood out for you in that video? What does a flourishing future look like to you? We'll do about 30 seconds and we'd love to see some of your answers in the chat. Yes. Oh my gosh. These are great, uh, great uh, things coming in. More self-reliance with and food security on this angle of food security. Sentier Urbain in Montreal is already turning parking lots into community gardens. Uh, degrowth, regenerative agriculture, more community, accessible public transit, um, green spaces, collaboration, community. Oh my gosh. I, I'm getting chills. Look, thinking. You know, just imagining what this could look like. And the. Jamie's story leaves me feeling inspired, but what I really notice is that the good came about in response to the challenges. She talks about floods, fires, unrest. These prompted communities to come together, and I know you have seen that in your work. And it always strikes me that it's not that different. You know, I might still binge watch Netflix in bed, but my laptop will be powered by clean energy. Um, and then, of course, there's the part about knowing we've staved off even worse effects for people who are already experiencing dangerous climate change, which is, of course, more important than Netflix. Um, the world that Jamie describes in that video is doable. It's being created as we speak. Here's just one example. This lovely green path you can see in the photo, that's behind my old apartment in Montreal. But when I lived there, it was this dingy alley with dumpsters in it. Now it's a safe, welcoming space that families use. And it's kind of wild to imagine that we could just do that across all of our cities. But we are. Montreal already has about 450 of these, uh, of these uh, green alleyways. Um, and there's greening programs like that um, all around. So we've imagined what a better future could look like now. How do we get there? Okay, well, let's start by looking at how climate action can make our communities and our lives better. We spoke with Alicia Richens, who's a sustainability consultant and advocate for the sustainable, sustainable development goals to hear all about the benefits of climate action. Hello, my name is Alicia Richens, and I'm a sustainability and social impact consultant and a fierce advocate for the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. The Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, or Global Goals, represent a global framework for sustainable development that spans the economic, social, and environmental spheres, and they aim to achieve 17 different goals by 2030. It's the first truly global framework for sustainable development that recognizes that all countries, rich and poor, big and small, north and south, have a lot of work to do to get there individually and together. So I really get excited about the way that the SDGs frame not only our interdependence as a global community, meaning the way that we depend on each other, but also the interdependence of all of our issues. We're not going to eradicate poverty, for instance, without achieving gender equality. Sustainable production and consumption can't exist without decent work. And the health of our natural ecosystems around us requires courageous climate action that we know is mostly led by women. There's so many ways that climate action provides additional benefits to communities. You know, on one hand, I think about the retrofitting that we need to do to make our buildings and cities more sustainable, um, and also building out our infrastructure for renewable energy. And, and the way that that not only gets us 
you know, emissions reduction, but it also gets us decent work. It also gets us reskilling and recooling, you know, otherwise ununionized, marginalized communities um, and gets them decent work that they can earn money and invest in themselves and their communities and, and just, you know, build out those ripple effects. To me, climate action is necessarily the same thing as climate justice. Because at the end of the day, it's really our histories of injustice and inequality and, you know, colonization, imperialism and land theft and extractivism and slavery. Those are all of the things that set us up for this problem today. And so in order to fix the problem, we need to address that past. We need to redress, you know, our history and the injustices between us and really reconcile our relationships with each other and with nature because that's the only way we're going to get courageous enough to take the action that so far isn't happening as fast as we need it what keeps me motivated is knowing that in the face of all, all this work we're actually working toward a better future for us and it's and it's that vision of you know clean air and green landscapes and healthy relationships with each other and those landscapes that really keeps me motivated because it's not like the world is perfect today and climate change is just coming to ruin everything right the world is already a hot mess about climate change um climate change is just making it worse but climate action and the work that we do to stave off climate change or to limit climate change is also the work that's going to make our communities and our lives better at the same time the world is already a hot mess, even without climate change. <laughs> I love how Alicia's examples embody what Dr. Beth Sowen calls multi-solving. One action, many benefits. And um, for me, the big three takeaways are, our problems are interdependent, but so are the solutions. I loved Alicia's examples of how building retrofits can reduce emissions and create decent work. Um, climate justice is key. To fix the problems, we need to address the injustices that created them. And climate change makes problems worse, but climate action makes life better. Okay, so to fix this, we need to wind down fossil fuel production stat. We need to get rid of climate pollution from transportation, but we also need to get rid of pollution from heating and cooling our buildings and the food we eat. So the fancy term for this is decarbonization, taking the carbon out of doing things. So how do we decarbonize in Canada? Well, we have to stop the pollution by getting off fossil fuels. Then we need to adapt our towns and cities so we can live our lives without polluting. And finally, we need to work with nature to absorb carbon and make our food system sustainable. Basically, we need to do all the things. Now, each of these could be a full course on its own, and we're not going to go deep into them, but let's look at some really quick examples from each of these three categories. Um, getting off fossil fuels. First, imagine what this could look like in your own life. Imagine if this was your last gas furnace or your last gas stove, and you were about to get a high efficiency heat pump and make your home more comfortable. I'm super pumped, get it, about my new heat pump that I'm uh, installing. And induction stoves really are the future. Uh, natural gas stoves create terrible indoor air quality and, and increase the risk of asthma. Now, Imagine scaling that across an entire community. Um, how could you help communities end energy poverty, benefit from cleaner air, and help the climate? Like in Heltzik Nation, where they replaced diesel furnaces in on-reserve homes with air source heat pumps that were powered by clean energy. Or if there's other ways too. What about training and mentoring energy advisors in underserved regions so that you can jumpstart the clean energy transition? Um, or helping to add solar panels to schools or nursing homes or wherever. I'm sure that you have other ideas too. What about adapting our towns and cities so people can live better without polluting? Well, we've already seen that transportation has a huge impact on our GHG emissions here in Canada. Now, imagine finding ways to active, add active transportation to your own life. It's healthier, it's usually faster, and it's definitely more pleasant to commute by bike or walking in places where it's possible. And it's not rocket science. When we give people safe and affordable options, many will leave their cars at home. At the community level, this means investments in rapid transit and safe walking and biking paths. It also means encouraging electric vehicles like electric buses and creating 15 minute cities where you can find everything you need within just 15 minutes of home. Paris is actually working on this right now. 
less driving also means cleaner air. In fact, it's estimated that we could save 112,000 deaths from air pollution by meeting Canada's net zero targets. Now, we all love this carbon sink. Working with nature can be as simple as planting a tree in your backyard or completely revolutionizing agricultural practices from rain gardens that help reduce flooding to protecting forests and wetlands to supporting regenerative farmers who are restoring soil health and in many cases growing culturally relevant crops. There are so many ways that we can help heal our ecosystems and encourage green and thriving communities. So these are just a tiny taste of the range of climate solutions out there. Notice as we go through these, do any of them pique your interest? Um, and notice that all of these solutions are already underway. We can do this. Um, Canada has mobilized before. Just think of the war effort or of course COVID-19, but up until now, the climate emergency has not been treated as, as such. And of course, it's as much about the way climate solutions are deployed as the solutions that we focus on. So for example, some solutions actually perpetuate colonial practices and create further injustice. For example, protecting landscapes so they store carbon. That sounds amazing, right? And it can be, but in practice, some nature-based solutions just exclude indigenous communities and undermine their rights and responsibilities to steward their lands and their waters. Colonialism is built on ideas of domination over land, over people, rather than recognizing our interdependence. And this ideology is a root cause of the climate crisis. Indigenous rights are the solution. We, the voices of Indigenous people must be centered in climate policymaking. This crisis needs what Dr. Uh, Emily Eaton, a scholar from the University of Regina, calls a 3D solution. Decarbonize, democratize, decolonize. We might feel overwhelmed by the scale of change, but remember, change happens slowly than all at once. Terry Fox is known all across Canada, but it didn't start out that way. In fact, he didn't really gain much attention during the long stretch from St. John's, Newfoundland until he crossed into Ontario. Then all at once he was on every news station. And now 40 years later, look at the legacy he's left. People who tell you change can't happen are invested in maintaining the status quo. The scale of change is only limited by our imagination. So let yourself imagine a rapid shift to a restorative, climate-safe future. And momentum is building. Just look at the rise in renewable energy, projected to account for 95% of new energy capacity in 2026. Does it need to be faster? Well, yes, of course. But as technology matures and we break down logistical barriers, the change snowballs. Um, this decade is our crucial window. That is why keeping the pressure to act now is so important. Okay, we've talked about the issue of climate change um, and how it's woven through everything we do and how it exacerbates the challenges that you're working to right in your communities. We've imagined what a flourishing future might look like and talked about what needs to happen. We need to get off fossil fuels. We need to adapt our cities. We need to work with nature and we need to center justice. Now, we wanna give you a moment to explore um, what this looks like in your roles as community lever leaders. Leaders, or leavers, leavers for change, that's good too. How can community foundations lead the shift to a flourishing, equitable, and climate safe future? Okay, I wanna prompt this by saying, you are already on this path. These happy guests in this photo came together to share food and explore this Halifax-based urban farm, which was funded through Canada's Healthy Communities Initiative. They're celebrating taking an unused space and repurposing it as a local green hub. You're doing the work. So the question is, how do you scale it up? Here's how this is going to work. We're going to send you on who are, uh, who are returning. Um, we, have a, we have a few minutes. Oh, I see some action on the uh, on group one gem board. Um, uh, we have a couple minutes and I'm here some folks what um yeah what are what are some things that what are some things that came up in your conversation we can do this just you can use the uh the the um reaction button and and put up your hand or feel free to just unmute and, and we'll just take a couple of reflections um 
Susan, I see a Susan with a raised hand. Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> my group, uh, we realized that we hadn't really put any stuff on the jam board. So this is a little bit from memory. Yeah. Uh, you know, I talked about the Rural Communities Foundation's um, uh, programs, uh, which were specifically oriented towards, um, uh, you know, kind of risky, small scale uh, projects, which were intended to, uh, you know, increase innovation and creativity and risk taking, uh, and also to build a community of problem solvers. Um, and then we had uh, folks uh, from Windsor who mentioned that, um, you know, because it's an auto town, um, it's, 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 it's a sort of a, a difficult process for people because they have so much of, of an identity tied up um, with automobiles, but, but uh, that, that reaching out to the municipalities uh, seems like that would be a particularly useful thing. Uh, and then, um, and I'm, I'm so sorry, I, I, my memory of people and faces is sometimes not very good. Uh, but uh, we, we also had a, mem a member who mentioned that, uh, that their foundation was really trying to do impact investing, uh, community-based investing, which um, you know, was, was oriented towards not ne necessarily um, uh, uh, not as much traditional investing, but more directly in the community. Uh, and that 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 has been, they've been seeing some nice results with that, and then our our fourth person from West Vancouver uh, mentioned that that she thought that perhaps that because wealthy families were in the foundation that their funds were growing comparatively slowly, and so that they were trying to find new partners and sort of new ways of 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 making inroads into some of those wealthier individuals. And I apologize, guys, if I if I got any of that wrong, um, feel free certainly to jump in and correct. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. and, <laughs> I'll, and, just, and I'll just, so it's me, I'm Elaine from West Vancouver, and I will just jump in with a little bit of a discussion around the fact, because I'd love to hear if anyone else is facing this. So one of the things that we're noticing is that um, from a high wealth community, there are a lot of families that have their own funds. Um, so they're not, in, in affiliation with the foundation necessarily, um, but we can have influence on them, you know, and we could help to harness some of that money, but it's kind of like their, their, their family funds may come to us when they decide to wrap them up, but at this point in time, they're pretty active. And so, you know, it's a little bit of how do we get inside of those discussions, you know, or how do we help to nudge them in this way? And, you know, one of the great examples that just happened is Chip Wilson's donation. Um, to, you know, BC parks and uh, which isn't necessarily strictly on climate, but it's in that spirit. And, uh, but that took a very long negotiation with BC parks. So I'm just, I'm interested if anyone else is seeing that. Yeah. And how do you have those conversations with them? Um, even just building up the, the, the knowledge like you're doing with your own staff and your boards, whatever. And then how do you extend those conversations into those those family foundations ultimately to shift the funds? But it's a it's a long walk, isn't it? I think we've got time for for maybe one or two more reflections. Is there? Uh, please feel free to unmute and 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 add, or if you want to put your hand up, we can uh, do that too. Any other things that kind of came up in your conversation? No, no one's feeling inspired to. If you do feel inspired, please uh, please jump in. But I'm also going to just notice that I, I'm looking at this Jamboard here and seeing um, there's education on climate, funding alternatives, um, personal impacts, windows and driveways, et cetera. Personal impacts can be a really interesting way. I think, I think like this is referring to personal actions, like what can people do to get fossil fuels out of their homes? And yeah, modeling this and showing people that... You, you know, you can go fossil fear free in your home. I'm doing that right now where we're getting rid of our natural gas furnace. Um, we've already got an electric stove. Those are the two places and, and, and uh, we're going to electric water heater as well. Um, oh, can everyone see the jam board is a, is a good question. The link should be there, but um, uh, if that's not working, then let us know Elaine. But yeah, showing how you can do that. We have one mnemonic that those of you who are in the cohort that we're gonna meet on Thursday, you'll hear me say fleet, heat, meet, repeat. So we have to, uh, if you scroll up, you can see the link, uh, but I can put it again. Um, 
uh, there it is. Thanks, Katrin. Um, making changes to in how we move around in the world, flying and driving, how we heat our homes, getting fossil fuels out of our homes, um, and the amount of like meat and dairy that we eat. Those are really actually high impact personal actions that we can do. And if you do them at the scale of a community, um, it really ramps up. And of course, we also need the, the larger systems change, but those things are not um, separate from each other. They can, we, we often talk about the ripples that we make. So the actions that we take, how can we encourage other folks to do them by, uh, by rippling it out? Um, I'm gonna shift gears now just to, um, uh, on this, but the Jamboard should be available for folks to keep looking at um, these actions. And for those of you who are in the cohort uh, and, and um, who will be meeting on Thursday, then I'm so excited we'll get a chance to continue this conversation. Um, let me just find, I have too many windows open now because I've been opening up other things, but <laughs> um, I want to leave you remembering that you actually have a really significant um, 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 ability to influence change. The, the acronym was heat fleet, as in how you move around in the world, heat, meet, and repeat, rinse and repeat. Just do that over and over again. Um, that can make a that can make a big difference. And the key is a lot of people are really burdened by things like, oh no, am I recycling right? Or am I bringing a reusable straw? That is a distraction from the big shifts that we need to change to totally um, reshape our economies. Um, and so helping people take the burden off this, because a lot of the burden has been put on individuals and it doesn't need to be. Let's focus on the high impact actions that we can all take um, and and yeah, and then give ourselves cut some slack as well. Okay. Um, yeah, the 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 philanthropy for climate um, implementation guide is such a fantastic resource uh, uh, that's available to you. And I know uh, you will have all have seen that before. Um, we'll pop the link in the chat. Oh, there, Kaltuna's already popped the link in the chat, just in case it's not handy for you. Um, and just to remind you that we're talking about mobilization on a massive scale. We're in the midst of this great transition, was Joanna Macy calls it the great turning. People in your community need your courage and your leadership and your compassion to help them navigate this new terrain. Change is hard for people. Um, at Project Neutral, we've been having these conversations for a long time, and I wanted to share a few additional tips that we've learned over the years. Um, so these are kind of some of our top tips. Number one, assume people care. Often we assume the opposite. We think, oh, I'm the only one that cares about this. In fact, a new study found that um, in the US, people uh, support for climate policies is double what most people think it is. Um, so when you talk about how climate change is connected to your work and your own life, that more often than not will help reshape um, kind of what people think is normal. Um, and you can help people realize that they're not alone. With that in mind, also make space for feelings. Um, this is a hard journey. And for a long time, we really focused on it as a science thing. It's not, this is affecting all of our lives. So make space for the feelings um, and we need you know, the courage to face it together. And this is super important. Shifting from doom to possibility. Uh, we talked about the ways that climate action is aligned with affordability and equity and health, but that is not the narrative that's widely understood, right? Um, there was a recent headline from the National Observer uh, that sums it up really well. It said, climate action equals smaller energy bills is the message every Canadian needs to hear. We normally think, oh, climate action is going to cost me more money. No, it's actually the reverse. Climate action can make life better, but you have the opportunity to help shift, uh, open up the imagination for what's possible and shift the way that people think about it. And you can do this by showing that the transition is already underway. Millions of people are already working on this. Um, so showcase your local climate champions who are making homes more comfortable and affordable through energy retrofits or championing local regenerative food programs or helping newcomers to Canada get their first bike, whatever it is. There, those initiatives are happening in your community, showcase them. Um, and I probably don't need to remind you uh, that communities are the key to climate resilience and action. Um, think back to our postcard from 2050, the, the, the Jamie video. She didn't know her neighbors until they came together to respond to an emergency. So communities really um, underpin our response, um, but also how we can transition in a way that really takes care of everyone. 
Um, we've been working at this uh, for more than a decade. And actually, I wanted to let you know that our programs are available to you. Many of them are free, uh, like Talk Climate to Me is the course for women. We've got a, a, a new session starting in October. Um, our, we've got a program for youth, Kids Cutting Carbon. Um, low Carbon Communities is coming online very soon, and it's all about measuring the climate impact of initiatives at, at a community scale. Um, and um, greening, Green From Home is our program for workplaces of all kinds. Um, and so these are available to you and we would love to continue the conversation and, and support you in your efforts. As we're wrapping up, I just want to leave you with a few of my takeaways. You probably have some of your own and I'd love to hear them, but here we go. The planet has a fever and it's gonna get worse because we're burning fossil fuels, but change is possible. We can fix it. Stop burning fossil fuels, restore healthy ecosystems so they capture carbon. And this can actually make life better. But we need you and everyone. I want to close with a poem by Adrian Rich, whose lines inspired the title of this galvanizing climate feminism anthology, All We Can Save. And she, she writes, my heart is moved by all I cannot save. So much has been destroyed. I have to cast my lot with those who age after age perversely with no extraordinary power reconstitute the world. You are doing the work to reconstitute the world to be healthier, more just, and more beautiful. And it's a magnificent thing to be alive at a moment that matters so much. So thank you for your time. Thank you to the Community Foundations of Canada for, uh, for inviting us to, to be here today. And yes, really encouraging you to uh, go forth with courage and compassion. And we're excited to see where you go from here. Oh, Katie, I just have to share. My heart is so grateful for you and for this moment that we've shared with you today. What a magnificent thing to be alive at a moment that matters so much. Imagine all of us holding that in our heart today as we leave and holding that place of courage, of curiosity, but also of action. action yeah. yeah. So everything that you shared with us today is about our well-being and everything that you've shared is also around how we have a shared responsibility to protect and preserve our climate and our planet. Thank you so much for what you've shared with us today. Thank you so much for reminding us of imagining, imagining the future, imagining for better opportunities for ourselves, our communities, and for others. And as we continue to venture along the course of climate change, it is one action at a time. As community foundations that are here with us today, we know that we each take leadership roles in taking climate action and recognizing the importance of working within our own organizations, with our communities, with our donors, with our community stakeholders and et cetera. Our responsibilities are in a leadership role and we can continue to navigate and continue to use our resources and tools to ensure that we have a bright and possible future. But we do know that climate change is complex and you shared that with us today and you challenged us with that today. But I'm also mindful, you gave us hope, you gave us courage and we are all part of this. We are all doing this together and we're all working towards a better and a sustainable future. I truly appreciate the engagement of everyone that joined us today. You participated, you took time to be curious, you took time to contribute. I was watching the jam board and oh my goodness, that was amazing to see. I also want to express my appreciation to Kaltoon that supported you today. Kaltoon, thank you so much. I was seeing all of your great chats and the great resources you were sharing with all of our attendees today via chat. So again, as we get ready to leave today, Thank you so much to all of you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Katie, for sharing your knowledge with us today. And as we leave today, I'm really mindful that many of us have more questions. And I'm really mindful that we have a responsibility to act upon our questions, to take and build our path forward. So as we leave today, please continue to be curious. Please continue to explore. 
and can please continue to use the toolkit and the other resources shared with you. We will be providing a follow-up email with everyone with a copy of the recording and as well as the various resources that have been shared today. So as you leave from today's webinar and you venture on to the rest of your day, hold space, be curious, and stay well. Thank you so much, all. Bye-bye.